When we started on June Bug Jack, um, we probably, a lot of our early grants focused on the creation of the work. And I hope you have an opportunity now with this maybe you know, somewhat shift in the funders to conceive of the whole project so that you're not driven by the funding to mm -hmm. just create the work because it's really the managerial part <clears throat> which I would rename the organizing part which is this organizing all these communities around the country or you know helping to get that um, in your uh, in your orbit <clears throat> if you look at it that way and uh, then the process out so I mean it would be really good if you could raise money that the creation of the work was set within but allowed you to do the, all this community organizing work and the follow through and so I would try to you know to conceive it big because the danger of course with this funding <coughs> situation always is you get one little piece right and you never you don't even get a piece enough of a piece to make the work so like you do a little piece on the work and then nine months later you get a little another piece and you can do the work and you don't have the whole organizing piece at all that gets left out and it just becomes piecemeal and before you know it it's like four years down the road and you just are getting your piece up and you haven't had enough money to do the other parts in sync and, and that kind of thing so maybe you should just go big bold conceive of it as this big national project <coughs> that's um, and, tr and try to, to raise money there and in your mind who would fund that um there well we were just talking the ford foundation sort of shifting they that shifted way out of, out of, hmm? they shifted really out of funding art yeah, yeah but the, the way that they describe this stuff there's definitely a way that a project like this fits into it where it's about you know institutions like solidifying their future so if it's uh you know a center like asian arts initiative saying this is pivotal to, to the sustenance of our future by engaging with our community in this way if that is, is what you kind of exploit for those for that those purposes that's that's absolutely true of this project and then it can have national impact in that way if then this project and you as artists become an agent to help those organizations, those places, those centers look at their future in that way. You're a collaborator on them doing that, for sure. Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations with Ford Foundation from the president to um, Orlando and Roberta and so forth in the last um, months. And, you know, the way Orlando, who you know is an award-winning filmmaker, he says, you know, the way he put it is that Ford no longer is making an award-winning film going to be enough. What they're looking at is, is transformation, community change, community uh, empowerment, and, you know, we just did this big study on community cultural development, which is the, the broad term we're using, using culture to develop communities. It's, it's like the missing it's this huge, powerful piece that nobody's tuned into. As we've all gone to our corners, the organizers have forgotten the role of art and culture. The artists have forgotten how they need community organizers. You know, it's all fractured, right? So Ford is, is going to be trying to put that um, back together around uh, change, transformation, community transformation, community problem solving. Um, is the way we're doing it in a foundation I work with. We've completely refocused one of our areas to community problem solving. And we're going to spend 10 uh, years helping communities increase their capacity to solve problems. And the arts is going to have to figure out how it can contribute to that goal. And we've got metrics. So like right now in our communities in the Minnesota North and South Dakota, 50% of the people say our community is sometimes successful at solving their problems. In 10 years, we're driving to 75% of the people in the community saying 
we as a community can solve our problems. So, you know, that's race and class are right at, at the center of that, of, of community issues. And I have, <clears throat> um, I think um, it's very useful information to have about what the foundation people are doing and all that. I think it's very useful. But I think it's more useful later that, you know, if we, if anybody, whether it's this project or any other, we carve out our strategy and our goals, which is where I see us sitting at, we define our goals in terms of what philanthropy is interested in. We'll be doing what philanthropy is interested in, not necessarily what we're interested in. So I think it's really crucial to, to start by saying what it is we want to do. Um, and, uh, and uh, certainly that has to track along with what's possible, but uh, I really think, you know, it's key, as um, uh, 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 Dudley, I'm asking you of another white guy, I know. Oh. <laughs> We're all so <laughs> uh, My friend, uh, uh, Alan Jaffe, the late Alan Jaffe, said there's some bargain he said, can't afford. And I was dead broke at the time. <laughs> so that made no sense to <laughs> so I said, like what, Alan? He said, something you don't want. No matter how cheap it is, you know, you can't afford it because you don't want it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, that's really important. I think there's another thing in a country as wealthy and as rich as it is. There will always be resources for whatever it is you really want to do. You may not get it on the terms or at the time or on the schedule and so forth, but something's going to be there when we get ready for it. I think we just have to be clear about what it is we're trying to get to. Yeah, I, I, and I agree in the sort of general about that, but already you're raising money. So um, I'm saying I, I would look at the big... I, I agree with your yeah. strategy. I agree with strategic concern. And um, also, you know, the, the, one of the uh, lessons out of Jim Buck Jack is that we figured something out and then we're really not able to take it to scale to the, its full scale and full test. And there's a saying the old people in this field have, which is that the field of art and social justice is littered with its successes. <laughs> you look at the last 30 years, so much was figured out that was it's just sitting there rusting because it never uh, found a way to go to scale. And I mean, it, it started for me right in the 70s. I saw these amazing plays coming up. One, um, and Robbie McCauley's Indian Blood. Um, I said, that play needs to go to every high school in the South. And it would have had, I just knew, I could feel it, what a strong effect that would have. And we had no means to make it happen. Make it happen. And so a lot of it has been in the distribution, a lot of the frustration. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just, as part of your strategy, really keep thinking about this distribution and the large, and the large thing you want to do. Now, when we began this Zuni project, we uh, made one smart move at the get-go, which we said it would be a 25-year project. So we co we committed to 25 years of working on, on together. So that changed the whole dynamic. And now we're at 28 years, you know, so we've extended. 
And because we took that time frame, uh, something was able to happen that could have never happened otherwise, which was um, uh, the first Zuni language theater was created and the Appalachian, one of the Appalachian Zuni plays we uh, made together is the standard text for teaching written Zuni, mm -hmm. which the alphabet wasn't invented until 1975. So instead of Dick and Jane, you have an Appalachian Zuni play that is, is now the standard text for all Zuni people of learning written Zuni. So, you know, the impact of that will go for uh, decades. Generations. Yeah, and for generations. But it's because we said 25 years. And of course, from a Native American perspective, we only have a we see a lot of events just it's happen in 300 with a stretch of the head, brother. <laughs> That's just a spit. <laughs> how, how many of you are involved in that? In that city work? Yeah. Oh, well, they're our whole community and their whole community because it had all this exchange. All the, We had all the kids from Zuni coming and falling in love with the Appalachian boys and girls and then back and forth. Well, who was at the table that said, we're signing on for 25 years of this. Pardon? Right Who's, who said it then? Who made the commitment to 25 years? We did, Redside and the, uh, our Zuni leaders there. Hey, it's a real funny story. The way we got them going is we would be out touring nationally, and we'd have a couple of down days, and I'd say, well, I'll go visit my friends over in Zuni Kickback. It's interesting because they have great story showing through this, that, and the other. And anyway, I just had friends there. It's someplace different to go. So we'd go over there, and as soon as we'd get there, of course, they made us go perform in the schools, and the kids were having so much fun listening to these big Appalachian stories, these archetypal stories, that it just embarrassed the Zunis that they had let their own great stories go under. So that was how it got going. They said, damn, our kids are just falling out of their chairs at these Appalachian stories. Where are our stories? They had the same kind of stories, <laughs> you know, but they, you know, and that's, how, that's what got them going. But we were just trying to kick back, but you know how that is. And then old Tommy Bledsoe, who looked exactly like ZZ Top, <laughs> I'll never forget, we were sitting up there watching traditional dances on top of the Pueblo down in the plaza. And uh, one Zuni teenager turned to the other and said, It's that CC top. Could be. <laughs> other said, What would CC top be doing here in Zuni? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it occurs to me that also uh, we will be spending some time in, amongst ourselves grappling with this idea of, uh, like you're saying, what are the specific roles of the people in the room? But while we have you gentlemen here, that maybe we want to uh, talk about what the possibilities of mentorship here are and uh, what, what do you see as a mentor and what do we see as a mentor? And because I, I, that may uh, indeed affect the way we proceed in terms of roles. And, and I'm still trying to understand what the fuck a Baba is. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I call you all the time? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck a Baba is? We got that on tape. <laughs> that's, that's the next, the, the next title of it. Wait, say it again. <laughs> what the fuck a Baba is. Baba. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck, a Bob is? Uh, well, but it's it's uh, it's exciting to um, think about just sharing work and uh, whatever it is, you know, um, and to feel like we're going to structure it over a term rather than just hit and miss, you know. Um, my own agenda right now is to uh, try to stabilize uh, Junebug Productions 
and to make it, um, to codify what we've been trying to do and to um, um, and to find a new leadership for it. Um, uh, I'm very happy with uh, what I think we found in, in Terry and um, in uh, Kyoko. Although I think uh, Kyoko's long-term view is not yet developed about what she wants for herself. And so uh, it, that, that's a big question. I keep prodding her on, what are you trying to do? <laughs> and she has trouble, but there's no rush to answer these questions. You know, it's just, if you don't answer for yourself, somebody's gonna answer for you. you know? So uh, it's a question in her interest, actually, that I want her to answer. But, uh, <clears throat> And we're going to be looking for a new artistic director because my game is to write. I mean, that's what I got into this work for. And um, I realize... By God, I'll go out saying that. <laughs> I'll go out too. <laughs> but I do know this, that if I don't get to it pretty soon, I will go out having said it. Soon won't be soon enough. <laughs> and so... Uh, uh, our big strategy is a transitional one, you know, from the founder and old leadership to a new role or a new leadership. And so that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm, anytime anybody got anybody an interest in a writing project, I have pen will travel. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be interested in that. But. Um, but I'm also really interested that the, um, at the while we were sitting downstairs, Jamie was, uh, and Dudley were talking about uh, the history of the arts movement and how it's been fragmented and broken up so that people don't know what that history is and don't know, and so therefore the history does not inform what we do and the choices we make, decisions that we make. So, you know, there's a great need for that, including what you're doing right now in terms of documenting the road that you're on. Um, and, uh, and at some point, if, you know, somebody decides to, to do it, it's important that somebody s take some time studying that the big pit picture that this kind of work fits into and helps to create. I happen to believe that it's the most important kind of work that's going on in the arts, certainly in this country, and perhaps elsewhere. The whole future of the human race as suggested by the apocalyptic scenario, <laughs> the future of, the human, of humankind is contingent, is certainly not contingent on the regional theater, uh, the dance uh, experience of what's been going on the last, in the, in the dominant, in the mainstream, you know, all the mainstream things. Those are songs those are swan songs, you know, songs and, uh, that come on the way to the elephant graveyard, you know. I mean, to mix the metaphor. Yeah, yeah, just to mix the metaphor a little bit. <laughs> but you know, um, we're living in a decadent culture that is dying, which is why the apocalyptic thing is not entirely off key to my Bingo. ear, Bingo. Uh, but uh, I don't, I don't, huh? I don't necessarily think that it's like the the the, the evangelicals are talking about where the rapture is going to come down and and God is going to come down in the sky and 
Gabriel's going to sound the trumpet. And we do have a trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it can't be heard around the world without the, uh, without the technology. <laughs> uh, and people are going to come up from the grave. I don't think we, I, some people believe that. I don't. Um, but I do think that there are no guarantees that just because we built this huge social and economic instrument that now pollutes the world with all kinds of waste that we don't even know what to do with, um, I don't think there's any guarantee that humanity will survive, you know? Um, and in fact, if we keep on the course we're on, I think it's the contrary. The guarantee tends to run in favor of, you know, the transformation of human life from what it is to something we cannot now imagine. Uh, so I think the kind of art that concerns these kind of questions is going to be a lot more valuable than Shakespeare was. That's when you think about it, what Shakespeare did was sort of comment on and catalog the transition from the aristocracy to uh, bourgeois democracy. You know, that's the, the, the notion that the kings and queens were the corporal representations of God on earth and therefore could do no wrong. Alan Nixon, who said if the governor does it, or the president does it, it can't be wrong. <laughs> you know? um, that notion, and Shakespeare comes along and you know, gets the British Empire to line up behind his songs about you know, that transition. And uh, the fact, transition from from the from the God God as as uh, to the bourgeois yeah and and uh, you know who suddenly realized that gods I mean those kings were human too and that any individual from that class could do the same things that kings were doing in fact could do it more and better <laughs> you know. But now that whole thing is turning to salt. Those, all those statues are just falling down. And the notion of permanent, you know, yeah, permanent divinity in, in, in flesh is it's not there. And what's going to be is up. I think our work is about Visualizing the death of the world. Yeah, yeah, about what we see happening as, as we build that new way of being in the world, you know? Did you all inherit Shakespeare as the epitome, paragon? Yes. Of course, that's what it was taught. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, there's, uh, I, I uh, agree with John. There's a, you were talking about a book, a really book I like so much called Morality Tale by Barry Unsworth, British writer. And it's about, it's, it's, it's brief, and I suggest reading it in the winter. And it's about the moment when uh, this traveling group of thespians doing morality tales turns to the psychological. To the, mm -hmm. to the actual community. Mm -hmm. Exactly what John's talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that W.H. Auden um, spotted in Shakespeare was that because just of this transition John's talking about, Shakespeare had this moment with language when it was, <clears throat> he had a common language of the people. It wasn't just the language, the special language of the aristocracy. Mm -hmm. The pre, you know, Latin, for example, mm -hmm. that the church was in. In other words, there was a lingua franca, the mm -hmm. common language that was rich in poetry, and that he happened to land at that moment 
which goes to John's point of the, trying to understand the historical moment we're in, which is so determinate, mm -hmm. is what we would say, that the moment you're in is very determinate about what the possibilities are. And Shakespeare had the good luck to get, I mean, he had the genius to take the language, but the good luck to have that moment. Somebody was going to do it. And, you know, as Bob Dylan said, Shakespeare was in the alley, so he did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it, it's just a What's sort of... What's the guy's name? Barry Unsworth. So, you know, what is the moment? You know, what's the moment yeah, now? And that's what we're describing. In terms of um, the role of mentorship, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, the roadside piece, what we're doing right now is uh, trying to make our footprints really clear so that whoever comes along 30 years from now will be able to look at all of our work and it'll be uh, spelled out what we were thinking, how our methodologies and so forth and so on. So we're not trying to pass on the company to individuals, but rather to pass on the ideas and methodologies and let the individual, I mean, I look at what you're doing as part of roadside theater coming up in a new incarnation, what Thousand Kites is doing. You know, it's not like this, you got to come to Whitesburg and I got to pass it on <laughs> like that. But I, I do do that too. Yeah, you do do that months. too. But so, I mean, I'm working with a lot of young people. I mean, that's where I'm focused is working with people who want to learn about the work. Um, and the one thing I know, I agree with John, that sometimes a nice structure is good so it's iterative, so that we know, okay, it, at, at, at this stage phase, which is going to occur in X period of time, there will be another click in, right? Uh, some role for us to play, where the role's in. And the other thing I know is that nothing really substitutes for getting down and, you know, doing the work together. You learn more about each other doing something, you know, whatever it is, actually doing, making something, whether it's, you know, making a, a theory or a play or anything. So, I, you know, I would just say I don't have any big theories about what a mentor should be, or I don't even use the word, I'm just, uh, you know, interested in, you know, being available to however, and I think it has to be, uh, you know, you all have to take a lot of the leadership in that, because you're going to be thinking about it more intentionally than John and I, and, and you, you need to think about how you can use us. I mean, that's what I'd say, how you can use me. I know one, one thing that had come up in a meeting that we had the other day, um, Dudley was, uh, and also Kyoko had raised it, and John had raised it at a point. We know, I know a lot more about John's schedule than yours, but uh, I, do, I definitely know everyone's pressed for time. And uh, John, maybe Kyoko had called for the other day, just being clear about what was being asked of you in terms of time. And that was where we had come back to this idea of thinking again, like, we need to get clear on what we're asking of someone because you know it's one thing to sign up to be a mentor and want to do the work and it's another thing when you start getting asked to do things that are beyond the realms of time that you have that exists i don't foresee that being a problem but it won't yeah but definitely we have some um we have some benchmarks that we've tried to set for ourselves um, throughout the course of this year um, and where we want to be in places that we feel we would really like to check back in with you and John. Um, and of course, we have John here locally, so we'll be, we'll be able to, he's a lot more accessible um, to, to do stuff face-to-face, uh, -face, but um, that there'll be some places specifically um, in the early fall um, as we get to around, um, we're going to do another retreat, a, a longer real retreat in July. And we've carved out two weeks that we'll spend together. Um, that we'll spend, spend I guess, a bulk of that time going over what we've discovered uh, in these different sessions that we've done. Uh, we've got New York scheduled for um, May. We've got uh, Mississippi scheduled for May. And then we've got Minneapolis. Looks like it's going to be scheduled for early July. 
Um, so the last two weeks of July, like we have carved out, that we'll probably spend a lot of that time, um, you know, reflecting on what we've learned and what the things that we're pulling out, what are the through lines, what are the you know the tidbits and different chunks, um, and moving into a, a, a draft form of what this might look like um, when it's complete. Um, but also some time between now and then, it will be stealing together to just um, continue brainstorming. Uh, we did a brainstorming session about three weeks ago. I think it was like mid-February, um, where we just spent a few hours um, just throwing out a, a topic or, you know, just hitting a, a theme or a phrase and then, you know, imagining what that would look like on stage, how you would present it or, you know, how you would present it to the community and um, came up with some really, really good stuff, you know, of course, we won't use all of it, all of it but it gives us some really good ideas about the possibilities of, of what this can be. Um, we're also um, where I think you could be really instrumental is is in the crafting of of the type of, of of curriculum framework that goes with the project. Um, so there's like, you know, how do how do we what are the tools and and what are those tools that really identify what what we're trying to do, you know, once we get this language down, how do we craft that into something that is that is that can be usable um, by communities, whether they're, you know, the universities, you know, community centers, whatever, whatever, art, you know, activist organizations, that we, we craft something that can be used that, that is multi-purpose um, kind of workbook or um, guidebook. We don't we don't know what it looks like, but I think that's something that you have a lot of experience with that we, we will probably call on you to, to help guide us through or these kids some pointers. That's just off the top of my head. The big thing I'm worried about with the project right now is that you don't have somebody um, designated who's going to worry about the community organizing piece. Mm -hmm. They need to be at, at, at least sitting in part of all that creative part mm -hmm. where you're just, just listening with another uh, uh, head, with mm -hmm. another hat on. Okay, I mean, because it's a whole piece. It's probably, if in the June Bug Jack, it was two thirds of the project mm -hmm. and um, the community organizing part. Who's the community organizer? Yeah, that's the problem. We didn't, that's what I'm saying. We oh, didn't, you didn't have, you didn't have a No, we had, we, you know, we didn't. And it w if we did designated and conceived of it, I mean, we, we knew the conception, but we didn't conceive of it or we didn't see the possibility or whatever. Of cons we never raised the money for the full-blown thing. So it, we knew there had to be a community organizer, and that was by turns Teresa. That was sometimes by turns somebody in roadside because we had a lot of capacity. We'd already gotten to that, but um, we just never could bring that that uh, position to full scale because, see, if, if that position let's just talk about this project now if you had that person right now sitting in here you know say so I talked to Kyoko about it whether that was something she was interested in she said yeah that would be an amazing job if you had somebody sitting in they would be thinking right now okay and not only the content of what you all are talking about how that's going to be used in organizing they would be thinking okay now how do we conceptualize this with the organizing piece and try to uh, raise a huge pot of money for the full conception rather than just the breakout? You know, so they would just, you know, you can't, you all to some degree are gonna be focused on making the piece like we were, and that's intense. But there's this other piece of work that has to happen simultaneously. And it's just been my experience, unless somebody is designated to just think about that, then it'll get, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll get a little left over, pushed on the side. That's why you stepped out of uprooted. Why what? Carlton stepped out of uprooted as an artist and worked as the project director and organizer. Exactly. So that he was only, but he sat through rehearsals and he was there. Well, so you understand it, what a big job it is. And how we've never really been able to bring that to full power. I've not seen any projects 
in the country that have been that bring, brought that to full flower. But don't you feel strongly that this person is someone that uh, exists on a, a level that can jump into the room pretty consistently and be around most of the project activities? Or can you see it? Or could you conceive it with people who uh, have expressed great interest in the project but maybe in another area um, of the country? You know, you're talking about sitting in the room and being there, so I'm wondering. Yeah, I don't know how all that's structured. I mean, I don't think they have to be one of you. Um, I mean, it could be somebody from anywhere, but mm -hmm. they're going to have to, you know, they got to understand the conception that you understand. They got to understand, they got to have a theory of community organizing, and you all have got to agree with that. You know, you've got to be on the same page with certain basic organizing principles. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, if I were just casting around, I would look for somebody maybe with a community organizing background, but who had made a critique of community organizing and had realized that what was missing from the community organizing uh, work was this power of culture and wanted to take the, the, the organizing methodologies and transmute them with culture. I mean, that's what I was working with uh, in, for about three, four years in the Central Valley with hardcore organizers was this transition into using culture as an organizing tool. And they were all, they all came up in the Olinsky style organizing. Where is the Central Valley? California. Right at Fresno. Mm -hmm. Bread basket. It'll probably serve us in that capacity to look outside of the demogra demographics that are in this room, I think, when we're really framing it. Explain that. It's meaning that we're two, two um, we're black, white, male, right? And to just add to that pot, well, maybe right. being a woman of some other persuasion, you know what I'm saying? This is what we, we, we ran into the other day as well um, in the State of the Nation meeting, is uh, being clear about uh, our definition of diversity and what it includes beyond color. Does right. it include religious affiliation, race, mm -hmm. um, what nationalities? Um, because like, I don't think Melissa would, uh, would say she was white. Mm -hmm. She would say she's colonial. Right. right. And so really also being clear about what those things are for us. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, what are we looking at in terms of our... I'm just saying some yeah, other than us I, I four. Totally hear yeah, I totally yes, yeah. And somebody who knows organizing in the South might not be so hip to what's going on in the organizing in the Central Valley. Mm -hmm. or, and well, organizing is, you know, depending on what school they come out of, is, you know, shares. If you're out of the uh, IAF, Alinsky style organizing, it doesn't matter if you're in the South or Central Valley, it's the same the same premises, the same principles, the same theory of change, etc. You go to the same organizing um, trainings. And, uh, so, I mean, you got to know your community. I mean, really this idea of, you know, changing a community story about race and class is pure organizing. I mean, what you do as an organizer, just in a thumb, as you all know, is you go, if I were going into this community around here to organize, I'd just go start listening, spend months listening to people's story, individual story, and I'd find six people who were concerned about the same thing. I said, would you, would you all come over to my house for dinner? I'm going to make some gumbo. You all share this, this concern about some issue and let's just hear each other's story. So then you start putting together a bigger story of the community, and then you figure out, okay, well, let's start analyzing the power dynamics that is suppressing our story or our issue, and let's organize around that. I mean, so, uh, you know, that's, that's classic organizing. It begins with the uh, individual, and the individual's experience, and then, bringing those individuals together and how they build and sharpen one another through their own deep personal experience and sharing that until you come to a point of solidarity and a, bill and, a, and a willingness to act because you feel empowered that you've got the story.
we've been able to put the story together. It's not just me in the corner worrying about this. And that's classic organizing. And of course, what art has the ability to do, that's why we always, with the story circles, go into a performative mode, because then you can take all those stories and you can craft them into a performance and lift them up on the stage and reach, uh, you know, a hundred times more people. And then you've just got to turn back and allow them to now participate in getting their story in the next performance. And what typically happens, this all that was starting to happen down here when uh, Richard Schechner came down, that, that thing I facilitated for three days, what was starting to happen was uh, they were interested in the community story in the early stages. And then they were going to take it over and do something for New Orleans. That was, you know, that's the way it typically goes. And you got a lot of artists in this movement who uh, sort of say they're community artists and so forth. And they're really only interested in the community story to the point where they put their genius on it. And then it kind of becomes their work of art, but I couldn't do it without the community. Well, that's a little different than empowering the community to just keep the, it's all participation. I, I, I want to explore that language, that, uh, that word. Participation? Empowering the community. Mm -hmm. And the relationship that it suggests. You know, it's sort of like... Um, Empowering itself. So. Yeah, I mean, because it's the other word that you get is outreach. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, which is predicated, I mean, we have to watch how this language mm -hmm. sneaks into our, to our, our way of describing what we do. Because um, language is the first step of co-optation, you know? Um, communities that Kalamu, your buddy Kalamu, Kalamu had said once, I don't know whether somebody told him or it was one of those sayings he made up, <laughs> but he said, anything I give you, I can take away. And that's so true. Mm -hmm. if, if I empower the community by my blessing, mm -hmm. in whatever form my blessing takes, then the community is riding off of my power. Mm -hmm. And I can take that power and invest it someplace else. And it's not accurate, moreover. It's not accurate. The community has power. Whether it recognizes and uses its power or not, you know, it has power. And if we see ourselves as a complement to that community, we can add to that power by giving our, making our contribution to it, but it's, it's something we join rather than create, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But our, our participation makes it stronger if we do well. But it's not ours either to take or to give or take away, to give or to take away. It's something collectively we create. You know, it's like, um, I find myself thinking about sex so often because it's such a good metaphor. <laughs> Not only because it's a good metaphor, but, <laughs> but partly. <laughs> partly. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, you don't give somebody a baby. You know, you work together to create this new thing. You know, and if it's not, if you don't work together, what happens is destructive rather than creative, you know? Because then you start exploiting each other. And it's just so, you know, the whole idea of community engagement as opposed to community outreach. You know, by joining with the community, you learn from the community, and the community learns from you. We learn from each other. That's a whole together, altogether different kind of relationship 
than me blessing you with my wisdom. You know? I think, um, you know, that, that uh, you can look at the uh, glossary we did if you get, um, that's part of that community cultural development report mm -hmm. that we just finished. You can get it through our website. We did a whole glossary of terms to try to clarify mm -hmm. that. We don't mm -hmm. use outreach, but rather in reach. I mean, what a community organizer does essentially is help community organize its power mm -hmm. and backs its way up. And that's mm -hmm. our whole methodology, barred from that. Mm -hmm. When we are working in communities, all we're trying to do is get work our way out of a job so that the, com the community mm -hmm. is uh, standing alone and that we then, at the end of our methodology, like in Zuni, have a peer that we collaborate as peers. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they mm -hmm. didn't even have anything when we started, but they organized themselves, and now we've got a peer, and they help organize others. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, that's, I mean, we've done a lot, I think, because we've um, been um, in resistance all these 30 years, having to push back against uh, the cultural definition and the cultural war sort of foisted on us that I think we have clarified a lot of that methodology, a lot of that terminology. What website is this? This is, um, well, it's the Imagining America uh, report, but it, you can get it through the roadside website. And we just have a glossary of terms that, you know, just tries to get at the issue John's talking about, of the co-option of language. But I'm just saying a lot of terminology, a lot of methodology is out there, um, is pretty clear. What isn't happening too much is people studying it and acting on it. That's what I see. In other words, I feel like we're further ahead. We've got stuff established, but it's not being taken and uh, translated into uh, the work to the degree it, it could be. So like if you look at, I don't know exactly the ins and outs of that transformer po uh, project mm -hmm. that takes place here, mm -hmm. but it just seems like there's a beat off from uh, that project and uh, really what we, what our methodology and what we're describing. I mean, I haven't studied it to know, but just picking up from people, there's, there's something a little different it's a right angle, it's not a beat off. Oh, it's that far. I think so. Yeah. Mm. And, and these are people, you know, that you, know, you want to count as colleagues in the field. It's a project, to what John said, that got a significant amount of money yeah. um, first, and then decided what it wanted to do with that money second. I see. And instead of, and, and never really even got off to a run and start, kind of jumped, hobbled out of the gates. But I think in every way, information has been uh, very scarce. They've not really publicized what their expectations are or their goals are. They created a website that no one uses. Mm -hmm. They've never at any level connected with what the people's needs were. They got a lot of money and said, we have a few good ideas. We're going to push them forward. And this work is being led by one of the nation's most reputable visual artists right now, this guy Rick Lowe, yeah. who's hot with the funders. And he's did, done good work in Houston. and so. That was just like a, a clear example of a post-Katrina project where their funders need intermediaries before they give money to New Orleans organizations directly. Transformers, Rick's, uh, Rick received the money from the Andy Warhol Foundation. So yeah, I mean it's fascinating. And what um, you know, what uh, this is like another of uh, John's and our themes, which is this uh, critical discourse. What we're basically um, <coughs> thinking is we've lost the critical discourse. So there's no way that they should be in a strong critical discourse. There's no way they should be able to get away with that. I mean, there should be, if you had a strong critical discourse in New Orleans, people would be pushing back on it, dissecting it, taking it apart. You know? So there's no discourse about it because it's just te it's deemed irrelevant. Yeah, okay, well. Well, they're right next door to me, and I didn't know what they do. Yeah, so maybe they're <laughs> deemed irrelevant. Well, I know I came in here for this three-day meeting to facilitate, uh -huh. and I got to the meeting with these people from international people coming, Richard Chetner coming from New York, 
And my brother Maurice was there, observing from the back. Bruce was there too. Bruce, oh, is this the guy yeah, yeah. Um, was from, from Trinidad? Trinidad. Trinidad. Transformer that was did that? Yeah. Issue with them. Maurice was rocking back on watching that. Star, <laughs> baby. So, yeah, Star, <laughs> baby. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, like, you know, that thing's going down. And uh, what's his name? One of your local guys here um, videoed the thing. And I said, uh, sure, you can video it. I was facilitating it, coordinating it. I said, uh, you can video it as long as everybody gets a, who wants it can get a copy of the videotape. And he wouldn't turn, he still to this day won't turn the videotape loose. That was Jansen? Yeah, he won't turn the videotape loose. And the reason I wanted the videotape is because it is just this document of uh, how community uh, process gets co-opted. And so I want to use it as a teaching tool. And there's, <laughs> there's no way they're gonna turn that thing loose. Right. And that was the agreement, that was the contract. It was on a handshake. Right. But you know, I've never had that happen. I've never had to you know, go to court to get something that we allowed him to videotape. But he won't turn that thing loose. Mm -hmm. I've tried 18 times. Yeah. And that's just, it's a, I mean, if we could watch that right now, as Maurice can say, Maurice was there. If, if, if we, it, was, it, was, it was the most interesting. It was writ large, wasn't it? it was the, yes, it was. It was, it was a it trip, was but it was a classic example of what happens and how it happens, you know yeah. what I'm saying, on the regular, on the regular, every time. If we're there or not, this is how it's happening. The co-option of, of um, communities. Wait, what happened? Like, what happened to this? Well, this, this guy was responsible supposedly for um, the Olympic opening Olympics Winter ceremony. Olympics the Winter Olympics um, in 2006 oh, right? good. you know and so he had like this like you know supposedly this fantastic show and he was like this big huge performance visual star. artist yeah yeah, yeah. Star. humongous he's a visionary and he's, he's a white guy from Trinidad mm -hmm. And he, he worked yes. all over the world. <laughs> and he worked all over the world. He's been he's, on 60 Minutes. He's been on the Good right. Morning America. Everything. This guy's the man. You know, the so man. we need him here to help, like, you know, help New Orleans, help New Orleans to express their culture because they have so much problems expressing their culture. That's right. So his and then plan, you got Richard Schechner, who's one of the main sort of thinkers in the performance field. My and friend. His, our did. friend. Did. And he brought, Richard's brought him down under wing. And his plan Richard's was support. to have like this giant um, ceremony through the streets where we would all have like this flags. giant, yeah, you know, like flags. We'd have like this giant like sheet that's like over everybody. And then he's gonna teach us how to parade. He just had a parade. I mean, that was the most. most he just kind of sitting there, like kind of holding your holding your breath there. Um, and uh, he, had, he, had, like, he uh, had a sample of, of this of costume that he thought was going to be very easy for everybody to make, and he had this music that, that would never play. And he, he was like, uh, "Thank God, it's going to be easy." He we had trouble on. putting on clothes here. Exactly. <laughs> he got up and he kind of modeled it for us how we were going to dance to the street. And uh, no, it's, it's, it, it was great. It was great. It was, I think we spent four hours talking about this after it was over. People that wasn't even there was like, you We caught it back in Mississippi. In Mississippi, Jackson. right. <laughs> oh, barbecue. But I mean, it was, it was a full blown, and you really saw the way the politics. Yeah, I, I, I saw part of it, but I didn't know what I was seeing. But let's talk about how that, that situation got righted. But so, in other words, we're just giving you. It the, hadn't gotten righted yet. Uh, right. Well, what happened? Uh, um, as I appreciate the situation about what now has become home New Orleans, that was initially Richard's idea. Mm -hmm. No. And, okay. As, as an error in the history. Was that Jan Bellarubia's idea and she called upon Richard? Yeah, to come Jan in? Gilbert. I'm sorry, okay. But, but, I mean, I'm sorry, not to say that's Richard's idea. He was called in as one of the first people, the big name to see about great garnering support for this idea. But after that meeting, the point I think is, People came to both Jan and Richard and expressed serious misgivings about that idea. Half did, and half said this is the best thing. Okay, yeah, yeah, we but the project did change after that meeting, yeah, it and it became more focused on neighborhoods, and it became more focused on the actual, as I have observed, home New Orleans, New Orleanians doing the work in those neighborhoods. But it was because they couldn't pull the money yeah. off for the other. I mean, Richard went to the Ford Foundation. And you know, right before he went to the Ford Foundation, I went to the Ford Foundation and said no. <laughs> you know. Well, uh, to Richard's credit, let me just say, Richard is my friend. Yeah. 
<laughs> I claim it. <laughs> Um, but he met that guy on an airplane <laughs> <laughs> and was impressed was by the guy's right. conversation. No, he he'd gone and seen the guy's work. He met him on an airplane. Yeah, he told me that. That's true. And he was impressed by that. And then he went and saw the work and was even more impressed. Oh, well, that, I won't be responsible for that. But, <laughs> but he did say when Jan, Jan had the idea for the home New Orleans, and she knew Gilbert, uh, Gilbert, Richard, when he was teaching here at Tulane. Uh, and uh, when he was working with us, he worked with the Free Southern Theater for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, that's why um, they, they, they plugged in. And Richard just happened to be sitting with Margaret Wilkerson on another airplane. Yeah, I know what I was <laughs> And he didn't intend to be raising money. He explicitly said he was not raising money. <laughs> I was much closer down to it. I know. <laughs> all right, all right, you tell it. You dude. got you got Richard's version, but anyway, <laughs> the point is you got Richard's version. I talk to Richard all the time. And I got Richard, I was sitting with Richard one time. I said, Richard, you, your work's about social justice. And I had him, I had him. Just like you thought you had me that time, I had Richard. I said, your work's about social justice, right, Richard? He said, uh, um, he could see where I had him, checkmate. He said, uh, social justice and experimentation. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so it's, it's Jan's husband that has the videotape, right? Yeah, yeah, he didn't know terms of this. But the sort of point is. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're not going to make that. You know, there's no way yeah. that's going to, no. that mistake's going to be made. But it, it's just an example of how things go wrong. Mm -hmm. And if we had a di critical discourse, if we had the person power, we would be critiquing these things. I mean, Richard's up for critique. He, you know, I he's cool with it. Go ahead. I have a question about critical discourse. My question is also about yeah, critical discourse. It's just you, you've brought it up several times, the, the losing of the critical discourse yeah. and the need to have a critical discourse. I would just ask you to elaborate on, to just unpack that. What the critical yeah, critical discourse. Dis and how does it happen? And yeah. How does it interact with the work? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, in the same way uh, writ large, we've lost uh, theater criticism in this country. We don't have theater criticism, we have Me advertising. The theater the world. It doesn't matter whether you're with uh, Lincoln Center. Nobody's seriously writing about the, the theater piece. They, you know, in San Francisco, they got the guy either cheering up out of his chair or bowled over in boredom. You know, it's all about advertising. Well, that, that's that piece of it. But what we've lost in our circle internally is the uh, uh, the willingness and the person power and the orientation and, you know you can name any number of factors to critique each other to just like John was doing when he came and saw that play of mine he didn't you know he was offering a critique this is what I didn't see in the piece. This is what I'm concerned about. And so then we began uh, uh, to talk about that critique and what we could do with that critique. And what I see in, in our own field of Roots, NPN, blah, 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 blah. And <laughs> John, believe me, and I went through it big time in the American Festival, mm -hmm. is a refusal to hold each other accountable. There is not accountability in our field. Despite all the bullshit about justice, peace, etc., people don't even hold each other accountable to their actions. Just saw it all the time. And you raise it, and it's deflected in a hundred ways. Well, so since we don't even have a frank critical discourse among ourselves, then we have no skill and no, um, no clarity to then become a critic of the Transformer project on out, on out. So, you know, so not being organized in our own minds 
and in our own uh, not being clear ourselves, then we can't even participate in a powerful way in the national discourse about cultural policy. And the cultural policy in this country is a de facto cultural policy, just like, um, you know, uh, de facto segregation. In other words, it's not the law, there's no cabinet level cultural policy, but there's an obvious cultural policy right. in this country. And what's happened for the last 30 years is that a handful of us have tried to maintain an honest discourse about that cultural policy not get reactionary, you know, but to, to deal in a rational way. And that's, what, that's why you hear John and I and a few other people philosophizing so much, which drove people crazy. Because what we were really trying to do was to talk about cultural policy. I believe that this whole conversation is about race and class in the United States of America and our inability to confronted. So she actually brought something to the table that encouraged people to get a little more frank and honest. Right. But you're right. In many ways it doesn't happen, but I wonder, did you observe a shift from when it was happening in a very public way at any point in this history to where it's moved almost into this kind of personal private banter? Yeah, I mean, it, the, I mean the marker for me is when uh, Reagan was elected. I mean Nixon mm -hmm. uh, was the biggest supporter of the NEA of any president, so you can't lay it to party in that way. And the NEA, I always argue that the NEA was like the Justice Department during the Civil Rights Movement, reluctant to support uh, the law, but the best thing that the movement had. Similarly, the NEA reluctant to move towards democracy, but the best thing we had. And it was chiefly the division coming out of the Civil Rights Movement, which was expansion arts, led uh, afterwards, uh, after the founder, by A.B. Spellman, combining with Bess Hawes in the Folk Arts which, uh, program, which is Bess is Alan Lomax's uh, sister, and Alan Lomax coined the term cultural equity, and in 1977 was already drawing the line between cultural diversity and biological diversity mm -hmm. and their interdependence. And, and showing how if one collapses, the other will collapse, or mm -hmm. they will collapse together. That biological, human diversity and biological diversity, is what he was saying, are codependent and will collapse together. So I mean, all this was out there, and when Reagan came in, <clears throat> they, they picked up the Heritage Foundation uh, blueprint, which was, it, it's all spelled out. We knew it at the time. One, they're going to go after the two endowments. They are an instrument of the liberal uh, left-wing agenda, and uh, we're going to dismantle them. Second, we're going to dismantle the entire nonprofit sector because the entire sector is not to our benefit. And they were moving towards, you know, uh, a theocracy was where the right wing was going on. We're going to, and then we're going to go in like we did in the 50s into the universities and we're going to purge them again. And we're going to get rid of all that left liberal mess. Now, I mean, that was all laid out there. And what happened is that uh, Hotzel came in at the NEA, Bill Bennett came in at <coughs> uh, any, any yeah, National Endowment for the Humanities. And Bill Bennett sat there, you know Bennett, he became the drug czar, you see him on TV now. He's the guy that got busted for gambling online and all that. Um, he's still a commentator. He came in and he functioned, I know this firsthand in many different ways, he functioned as a censor. He looked at all the grants that he inherited and he didn't pay any attention except to what ideological line he imagined they were following. And the ones that didn't follow the ideological line that he believed in, which was the great Western tradition, yet, just like in common, yet, no. And then the others, fine. And if he saw, I had a friend who was the head of the New Jersey uh, Humanities Council. He gets this call from Bill Bennett. Don't like that grant you just, um, you just approved. Uh, want you to uh, make sure it doesn't go forward. This guy says, what do you mean? I can't undo a panel decision. I'm just the chair of it. He said, undo it, hung up. 
So that's Bill Bennett, <clears throat> you know, and he defined, from the little world I know, he defined political correctness. And in that perfect um, uh, Republican paradigm said, this, I now, since I have just defined political correctness, I'm going to turn it over and say that the whole left, right, le the whole liberal left, they are the politically correct ones. And I'm going to make them swallow it, hook, line, and sinker. And so that began the whole thing about political correctness. They launched the culture war. And, you know, that put, the culture war put a lot of our work at risk because I found myself in the position of having to support Karen Finley and her performance art on the basis of freedom of expression. But Karen Finley's work couldn't have been more out of touch with anything that our communities, and I, we were mainly poor white and working all communities of color, were interested in. I mean, you know, so we ended up supporting essentially. You mean you wouldn't be interested in seeing her shit on stage and somebody come up and eat it? It wasn't real shit. That was the problem. Yeah. It was a chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have been right in for it. <laughs> So, you know, so then... Y'all were doing some wild stuff, man. <laughs> so then we no, got... Sit, <laughs> so then we got, you know, we had to defend that. And, uh, you know, that was the culture war. Boop, 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 boop. And uh, there was never any reciprocity. Those people who were all upper middle class white, they never did one thing for the rest of our group that was struggling about a little harder problems than the ability to poop on stage. <laughs> you know, and we never got anything back, but we, so I mean, it's just, it, it was just Machiavellian how it unfolded. But that was the point for me. That's where I marked the point because it was a conscious strategy. And of course, that's just picking a point to try to clarify. It's a conscious strategy to eliminate the discourse to, to, to protect your interests? It, it was a strategy on their part to dominate the discourse, right. to take over the discourse, to, to, dominate, to dismiss any kind of democratic discourse, and to re-elevate the Western European, it's like the last gasp of imperialism, is how, of colonialism, imperialism is how some people looked at it. But I mean, the odd thing for me as a theater person is that just the luck of the draw, right? I'm born into this time and where in diminishing de decades, I'm less able to practice art, and I have to spend more and more time as a dissident sort of combating this policy. I mean, I would have, John and I would, would have much more enjoyed making six more plays than having to, you know, keep diagnosing and dicing and going to meetings and pushing back on this stuff and, you know, feeling like always stuck out on a limb. And you know, I know all Barack Gasselle and all those people, and you know, they are all, you know, the, they are sort of compromising stuff themselves, and nobody's holding their, them accountable. And so, you know, when when <clears throat> when the air clears, there are just not that many people who stood true, mm -hmm. and that's going to be true in any kind of deal. You know, people got to make a living; they're going to go here, going to go with the time, and so the the discourse is somewhat. Um, you know, been thinned down. Yeah, but that's to be expected. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, uh, power concedes nothing without struggle, you know, and the people who have the power are going to struggle to extend their advantage. And, you know, that, and that's a political question to be sure, but it has consequence artistically. You know, because, well, to stay with Shakespeare for a moment, Shakespeare, my friend Ted Warren said of uh, Shakespeare, he's, he's my mentor as a writer. Uh, uh, Ted Warren is. Yeah. Uh, Our Land. Did you ever read it yet? Mm -hmm. You found it? Mm -hmm. Do you like it? Yeah, I think you sent it to me. <laughs> yeah, the, the, Ted said of uh, Shakespeare, he said, uh, well, I have to tell you a little more of the story. Um, Ted was, uh, we were doing our land, and I was directing. And T 
Ted knew, he wrote the play in 42, I believe. Mm. It was produced on Broadway in 47 and has been produced only a few times since then. And, uh, but in 1975, it must have been, 74, 75, Ted came down as writer in residence to attend, uh, I didn't know Ted before this, but he came down and Ted knew every goddamn line of the play. <laughs> and, and whenever anybody misquoted a line in rehearsal, Ted, by that time, he was, he was more than a little drunk because he had his first drink when he got up in the morning and poured Johnny Walker red label into his coffee with a little honey. <laughs> he kept that, by noon, that little uh, half pint was gone and he had him another one before two o'clock. <laughs> and Ted, by this time, a day in the evening, we had to work in the evening, everybody was, he, was, he was fairly well kited. <laughs> and so, so Ted would sit there in rehearsal listening like this, that's not the way I wrote that line. <laughs> <laughs> and he quote the line. He said, "Tell them what to do. Tell them." <laughs> he said, "Ted, they, they're just trying to find the play right now. Just they'll be all right." Got mad at me. I think if he had been less drunk, he might have hit me. <laughs> but he'd been afraid he wouldn't have hit me. He'd have missed. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, I wanted to get Ted out of the way in these rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> Having invited him down to be a writer in residence, I couldn't tell him to go back to Chicago. So I said, so this lady who did Shakespeare in Modern Dress, I can't remember her name. Modern Dress. Yeah, and she did it in the schools, went down to the schools doing Shakespeare's plays in contemporary dress. And she was here doing a residence, and somebody told her about our work, and she came over to the theater that night. I said, I know exactly what to do. She was about 80 like Ted was. <laughs> I'll hook them up. She was an attractive 80-year-old woman. <laughs> and Ted had been married to a white woman, so I figured he, he might find her attractive. <laughs> so I was going to send them out to have a good time. <laughs> so you can get some work done. So I get some work done. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Ted, this is whatever her name. She was a, a Czech or Serbian. I don't remember what. Uh, and uh, I said, she does Shakespeare in modern dress. Ted looked at her and said, why the hell would anyone want to do Shakespeare today? <laughs> My plan was gone. <laughs> It complicated matters. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendously. <laughs> so it was a mess, but um, <laughs> I lost my point. But, well, that was it. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, that was... Uh, oh, see nothing about struggle. Yeah, yeah. And so all those people, I mean, um, are trying to put work forward that supports their philosophical and political and economic and social agenda. People who go to the regional theaters, the regional theaters grew up as a way of taking the theater away from the uh, New York and building up, it, it got converted into a trial uh, thing, uh -huh. you know. To, where see, they to go get out to New York. Yeah, and, 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 and they pulled it right back into the service. And it's, a, it's kind of a mess, but the alternative is not to be developed in dialogue with those people. We have to seize control of the agenda, of the dialogue, build it up from our relationships and our work with each other, um, and continue to open up new doors for people to come into. That's why Roots was so valuable in its early stages. I'm not so sure what Roots is into now. Uh, but, uh, but, and, and, but we lost, we lost something, and I'm not sure what it is. 
you know. Um, I think it's worth fighting for, you know. I think it alludes back to what Dudley said earlier, is the fact that now we're making art for each other, mm -hmm. as opposed to really, really having the, the, the carpenter and the whoever in there as the community agents. Mm -hmm. We think of ourselves as our own communities. But as a, a lot mean, of times. as a means of survival in the world that is degradating that you talked about, roots stop to turn internally at its own identity and saying, we can't move forward looking like this anymore as well. It's another step that I think it made in terms of pushing again outwards, mm -hmm. which is to look at racial identity within the organization mm -hmm. and had made a lot of the efforts of the organization turn internally to deal with, I feel like, mm -hmm. who's at the table. That's not bad if it breathes, you know? If you move over here to, I mean, if it's raining on the roof, you move over to fix that. And if that opens up a crack in the floor, you move over there. But you don't lose sight that the whole house is what we got to live in. You know so what I'm saying? You gotta, we gotta keep, keep moving and, and punching and backing so, off, defend, punch, defend. What was so valuable? You just said a little bit. That's what I think was so valuable about Roots. It became, it was, uh, we, we went through a whole period during, uh, when was that? When, uh, when Ruby uh, uh, started inviting those critics to come down? In the 80s. Yeah, uh, was that the end of the 80s? Yeah, yeah, we went pretty much maybe to, I don't know when she left. Then. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. in the 80s to. Yeah, we started bringing, being, bringing um, critics in, and not those top line critics you know, who were in the New York Times and stuff. People are serious students of the forms. And they had some currency. They were people who would, whose names you would know if I could think of them. But uh, they would come and they would just hang out with us and, and we'd begin, and we'd argue. I mean, no, 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 that's, I don't care if you are a big critic from somewhere. You know that's not what I'm trying to do. So, and we be, and then we started trying to figure out, you know, what the role of critics in our work had to be, or uh, in, in art should be. I mean, we were more aggressive than that. We didn't say just our work. We said in art, mm -hmm. um, because as I said earlier. I really believe that this is the most important art that's going on in the country and perhaps in uh, a comparable people in the Western world, you know, because um, we're, we're trying to do something here that is genuinely needed by the culture, not something that's needed by the people who make money off of it, and that being the definition of that it's good. Um, so we were trying to build up a, a corpus of critical work. Uh, the, when I was chair, we tried to get instruments like the, the, the um, newsletters of the various, uh, uh, like the, the, the Mars D's is organization, what is that? Southern Poverty. Law Center. Law Center get them to publish critical writing, you know, so that their constituency, which was considerable and still is, could start thinking, oh, that's the kind of theater piece we ought to have in our community, mm -hmm. and not Alabama Shakespeare, you know, uh, and, as opposed to Alabama Shakespeare and so forth. And there's lots of other journals of that type, Southern Arts, uh, the, the things, Southern Studies, and Institute for Southern Studies, I said. Southern Exposure. Southern Exposure. Right. That would be a good place to publish stuff. The Highlander Newsletter, that would be a good place to put uh, critical evaluations mm -hmm. and help people. And if we did that, even now, if we did that kind of stuff now, it would open up venues mm -hmm for the work to be done and to be seen, you know? Or even if it didn't open up venues, it would open up audiences. So that when you went to uh, 
Birmingham or wherever and advertise saying in, say in, the, in, the, in those newsletters, we're going to be in uh, Birmingham. Right. Here's our touring schedule for the next right. six months. Come. This, this was based on an analysis that what you saw in the progressive political movement was conservative attitudes towards culture. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason being is because, in our analysis, is because culture is so powerful that the power base could concede politics, could, con you know, could negotiate politics. Everything was negotiable but culture. They had to stay control, st keep control of that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I tell this story that I uh, heard that somebody said that's too uh, perfect to be true, but it is, that during the 2000 election, this reporter in Florida comes up to these two guys do doing a story on what people are thinking is at stake in the Bush election, 2000 election. Two guys retired sitting by the pool, says, what's at stake? And the guy, First guy says the economy, and second guy says uh, and the Supreme Court, and then the both of them say together and uh, the culture, and the report says, well, you know, I understand the economy, the right versus the liberal conservative economy, the Supreme Court. I'm saying, what do you mean by the culture? And the guys finish each other's sentence. Who controls the culture controls the story the country tells itself, the nation tells itself. So they can concede anything but that. Mm -hmm. That's the master narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing we're working on. And what happened in, at Roots, in my view, is um, on the internal critical discourse, is we didn't have a formal way to step back and say, look, we all love each other. Now let's try to understand what's happening here in the organization. Let's just step back, take the time to do that. To, you know, get everybody's point of view. Let, let's not feel like we gotta do the next program and make the next play. Let's just take time out and reflect. Whatever time, if it takes six months, let's take the whole and whatever. And what we would have figured out at that, one of the things we would have been able to bring to consciousness was the fact that in the South, there was such a dearth of opportunity for the gay community to be out and together that that became this huge need. And Roots was satisfying that need. Now, that didn't happen to be what we founded Roots around because it was around social justice. But it was this huge need, that it was so huge that it had sort of underneath taken over the organization. And that would have been fine if we could have clarified that. You know, then, like, I could have gotten in support of that through Roadside Theater in the Appalachians, you know, whatever. But we never got clear about what was really controlling the agenda. So we pretended that, that social justice was controlling the agenda when really the, the energy was on this other, this other need, um, this other issue. So we never got the internal, so then there was a lot of struggle around mm -hmm. what direction uh, to, for the organization to take. And it, it didn't have to be um, a win-lose, either social justice or gay issues. I mean. You know, we could have, we just needed to be clear, Wait. and then we could have worked together. I'm confused about why you're separating um, gay justice with social justice. Well, we were, exactly, we would have, if we'd have gotten clear about that being the issue, then we could have said, this is part of the struggle for social justice, this is the piece where, this is where the, the, the majority of people want to place the struggle right now, yeah. and that's what we'll do. So we weren't, I'm not separating. No, the lack, I think it's, it's a lack, is of, lack of transparency, <laughs> which breeds the lack of trust. Okay. You know but you're, you're okay. absolutely right. I'm just, and what John and I were concerned about was race and class mm -hmm. rather than those issues. But it was absolutely a social justice issue, and we could have gotten uh, fully behind it. Mm -hmm. 
and would have been happy to. But needed that conversation to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. So and so what was happening is they were saying, oh yeah, we're all about race and class. Mm -hmm. Um, struggle, kind of, I sort mean, of, because it wasn't clear. Because we, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't clear. clear. So anyway, we never got any clear uh, strategies. So that was the internal thing breaking down, and then from there, because of all these other things, it, it just it never got clear, and so we never got got a powerful, and that was the internal piece, and so being weak internally, being unclear internally then we didn't have the clarity to be as forceful externally as we needed to be. What you're saying echoes what Nick said at, at that last State of the Nation meeting, which was like what, root, what Roots ought to do or could do would be to take a year off all of its programming. I said that to oh. Carlson. No, I just went on now, so Yeah, Carlson I'm just figuring himself out. For a long time. Mm -hmm. That we don't take the time to analyze. We had a meeting recently where we were talking about this festival that we have for next week called State of the Nation. Mm -hmm. And we were analyzing the way we work and where, where is power held and how are we working and how do we invite people into our group and how is this sustainable. And uh, based around an incident that happened where uh, uh, an outsider in particular, a black woman, came into this group and did not feel like she knew how we were working and felt isolated. And, um, we're making the point that we don't work in a way right now that allows us to practice the values that we want to be practicing because it is chaotic and it is not our central focus. It's one of many things that we do programmatically and everyone's scrambling as organizations to get a million things done. So. But this whole area of uh, critical discourse is is major. How do you get better if you don't uh -huh. criticize? You know? Yeah. And a follow-up question just based on like what you said is A, like the need to have that discourse so that you can, as you say, get better, but also what needs to be in place for that discourse to be able to happen and to happen frankly. And were you able from this moment, Dudley, where you felt that things sort of started to fall apart and that discourse was lost, were you able to identify what could be put in place or what you needed to change so that so that it would be facilitated, so that people would be more open and frank and those conversations could occur, like what could change? Well, I, I'll take a hit on that. I think uh, just in terms of criticism, the critic who tells me that uh, my work will be of little interest to white middle class theater goers in New York City and is not being helpful because that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, um, <clears throat> we could go on and generate ex examples of that sort, but the idea is that for the critique to be useful, it has to be, tr has to be trying to achieve the same objectives that the artist is trying to achieve and that the audience is trying to receive, to achieve. So if the artist is going this way and the audience is going that way and the artist is doing this. <laughs> the critic, yeah. And, uh, and the critic, uh, yeah, right, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, it's not gonna happen. So the first requirement is clarity about what the goals are. You know, just like uh, what the mission is, you know which is why I'm so disappointed that uh, David Cuthbert has not been replaced at the newspaper here, because he, he figured that out with lots of arguments and stuff, but he figured it out. And my job is not to send these theater people off to New York or to Los Angeles, or even to recruit 
Los Angeles uh, uh, Hollywood uh, folks, here. folks to come, to come here. here to make movies. If they do, fine, but that's, that's not his job. His job is to strengthen the community of audiences here so that they are better served by the artists here who are trying to generate work. Mm -hmm. And the newspaper didn't understand that before. I don't think they understand it now. But, uh, and, but as advocates for the arts, we ought to advocate for that. You know, for critics who understand what their role is. Not that they necessarily like everything we do. That's not the job. Mm -hmm. It's to build the resource for the community to strengthen its own grasp on its own efforts to improve itself in the social historical context that exists here. So way more than just opinionated thought. Yeah, it's, it, you, it, it's, it's about values mm -hmm. and, and it's making us all stronger, you know. So if you, you know, to get to the roots example, what we could have done, like the timeout, if you had come in and watched Roots and said, oh, I see what's happening here. You got one group, you're all concerned about social justice, but you got one group that's talking about race and class. That was the founding, it was founded at Islander, they were all, but what you've had emerge is this issue of gay and lesbian uh, uh, rights and life and, and that, that's, you know, that's, that's the social justice that they're, the majority are concerned about. All you all need to do now is just be clear about that and start working on, you know, get a consensus that that's what you're going to do for X amount of time. Then you can start bringing race and class into that struggle because, you know, that's, but that's where the energy is. But we didn't have that clarity, that simple clarity. And we didn't have a process that rocked us back enough or brought someone in who could make, help us make the uh, diagnosis. So we were like lost in the forest, right? Couldn't see the whole, the whole, I mean, lost among the trees and couldn't see really what was happening. That's what happens time and time again. So you have to set up a mechanism that draws you back. I mean, we were trying consciously to work on the problem. We brought people like Alan Bolt came in from Nicaragua. He's very helpful because the first thing he saw, he said, my goodness, <coughs> here you all are, these artists that are concerned about making work for the mass of people. You know, you, your audience is 85% of the Americans versus the 15% and yet your work is so little. John, you're doing a one-person show. You know, why is your work so little, one person, and you're reaching the whole man? Or roadside, you know, you've got three people. But, you know, why, what's, what's, this, what's this about? You know, just, and so that, you know, so that, that was something. You know? was, that's what he said. And so that, you know, that, you know, that kind of critique, that's what I'm saying about the critical discourse. You just, we didn't do enough of it, and we... Uh, yeah, I agree, and I think that what has happened is, is throughout the evolution of that in Roots has been that, that people have come to the organization, um, mm -hmm. have been attracted to the organization because of it being a safe space for the homosexual, you know, lesbian, um, gay issues that aren't really people who are interested in, in broader social justice. We diagnosed that. We, we had a, took a survey. I said, well, let's, you know, I was like Maurice. I mean, I was a young Maurice back then. I couldn't play the horn, but I was on to the facts. Can we get some facts here? <laughs> and so we took, had this survey at the annual meeting, and we didn't know who the membership was from a socioeconomic point of view. Hell, it turned out that three quarters of the membership was rich. <laughs> and they came there, it was like they were slumming when they came there. They had these huge incomes. And we're saying, oh, damn. <laughs> now I understand why they don't want to do what Carlton just said. They got big bank accounts. They, they're not in the same boat we're in. You know, so it was like, exactly. 
And then, so John and I, you know, we said, well, we can't deal with this anymore. We're going to start something called the American Festival, and we're only going to bring people in that we know are committed. <laughs> and poor. <laughs> and poor. Okay. And so we formed that coalition as a way to, you know, we couldn't deal with this other, so we formed that. And <clears throat> I guess the mistake we made was we didn't keep enough control over it. So we didn't provide enough leadership would be another way. So it, we spread that, you know, by then it got to be a, a coalition of maybe, what, 10 or 11 companies from around the country. Uh, Jale's one, Urban Bush Women. And what we found out then is, <clears throat> John said something really true, I think, this morning about these processes. If you look at the roadside company, or the June Bug Company, not everybody was anything like on the same page that John and I were. I mean, there were people in the June Bug, which was sort of a pickup company, I guess you would say, and the roadside was more permanent. But still, there were people who didn't share our analysis. They didn't care about social justice past a point. Well, <clears throat> we found the same thing in the American Festival. That you know, everybody said that's what they when we handpicked them, so you know we checked it all out. But as it turned out, that wasn't the bottom line for a lot of the groups. So when we would raise issues contingent to that concern, no, that's not it. The, the thing is, we need money to do our work. You know, so people said, no, you all have been getting all the money. We need money to do our work. Don't talk about, you know, don't go on and on about this bigger stuff. So that then went bluey after, you know, some over a decade of really powerful work. And so, I, you know, there's a longevity thing. I mean, when we founded Roots, you know, I was in on the founding of it. And we said in, I don't remember, I think we said in four five, years. Five years, five, five years. years, we will disband. Huh. And it'll be automatic. And it, it'll come back up or not, but we will not perpetuate. So what time span was the ATF? Uh, AFT. AFT. AFT, I'm sorry. AFT. 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 It began in 1981 in San Francisco with Teatro Campesino, Junebug, Roadside, Traveling Jewish, Jewish Theater four groups that we pulled together for the People's Theater Festival. It's a huge festival. And then um, uh, a Robert dozen so other much. companies local. Hugh, Robert Bly was there. We had a whole humanities component. I mean, that's the other thing that, um, that it, it, it would be hard for you all to understand how much uh, wind under our sails we had back then. I mean, it was not it, we were able to pull off that kind of major festival in 81 that you couldn't even imagine hitting that scale now. I mean, this was a three-week festival, a huge humanities piece, a huge performance piece. I mean, uh, uh, Campesino, that's Luis Valdez, out of the farm workers, his piece ran for um, uh, f five weeks. His piece was created um, out from when we were sitting up at three in the morning drinking, he was smoking a cigar and we were carrying on. And out of seeing the analogy between the corridos and the Appalachian jacktails, and he said, I got it. Took a big puff and created that play. And so, you know, there was all this working at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were spending a lot of time with each other. I mean, you know, John came up and lived in the mountains for two months every summer for a period of, I mean, it was just mm -hmm. spending a lot of time. Relationship yeah, and, and staying up late. And um, so, I mean, we just had, a, there were a lot of possibilities then that you all are just inherent in <laughs> such a suppressed mm -hmm. situation. And, you know, there's no way you can know what it feels like to have that kind of wind under your sails, to have things breaking your way like that. You know, you just, you can't, because you haven't, it. You know, right? Yeah, and that, you know, you're talking about it in a kind of personal, intimate way, but the, but the reality is that the, I mean, the larger reality that's a part of, let right. me put that, uh, is that the, the civil rights movement had built a huge following. That's right. 
the peace movement had built a huge following. They overlapped each other. <coughs> the, uh, the human rights movement was, was on the rise. Uh, the gay and le lesbian movement was on the rise and, um, and was seen as mm, uh, complementary forces, all these forces. And every time you turn around, there was another meeting in which you see and Some meet folks. new people, see the old, old people and meet new people, and 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 uh, and so there was a there was a rich dialogue going on. You didn't hear many. You didn't hear people in our wing of the discussion anyway, saying that artists are the leaders of the political movement, which I hear a lot now that it's our job as artists to, to lead the political movement. Our job was to try to understand the political movement and, to, the and, to, and to reflect it mm -hmm. and help the movement build its constituency through our work. And, and uh, so it was, a, it, but, and the government, when they decided they were going to get us, they didn't aim at the arts. They aimed, they, they did uh, secondarily, but they aimed at putting the civil rights workers in jail or running them out of the country. They aimed at putting the peaceniks in jail or running them out of the country. They aimed at, the, they had a little trouble aiming at the human rights people because they were a new contributor to the force and, uh, and, they, were, and, and they, were, they were kind of careful in the language that they used. Uh, they tuck that thing under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, mm -hmm. and they were legalistic in a certain kind of way. Um, shoot, the rest of us were just saying, "Fuck this," <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and so forth. But that movement got aborted by, by, uh, and it never achieved the force it could have achieved because we didn't know enough about what we were doing. That's what it boils down to. We, we didn't even know that uh, we had history. You know, we didn't know about the Southern Tenant Farmers Union and all that kind of work that was going on in the South until we began to meet people who were involved in those days and in those places. Um, and, but the continuity between the, S, uh, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union and the Federation of Southern Cooperatives was very tenuous because they didn't know. The younger people didn't know what the older people had been doing and, uh, and what they learned as a result. And so what gets communicated is the confusion about that, or even worse, the agenda that the academics and the, and the government wish, they want to create the narrative, uh, to borrow your term, they want to it could create the narrative that people then study, learn, and employ in their work, which is the conversion of the thing into its opposite. You know, and so we got a big job to do. So as long as things were trending, if you use that word, in our direction, then it was easy to pull the American Festival Coalition together. As soon as the, the trend or that wind under it started collapsing in the historical circumstances, then there wasn't enough grit to stick with it, the reason wasn't enough grit is because we didn't know enough to push it, to clarify. We didn't reflect enough. We didn't. We just didn't do the work. I so, mean, so with that analysis right there, so right now we have a huge um, contingency of people who's talking about ecological or the ecosystem, you know, environmental movement. We have um, this this movement around. Um, immigration and you know that whole thing we have this movement around the economy right mm -hmm. 
Would it be to our purpose or to our would it be would it would it be instrumental for us to to use that that analysis that you just use as riding that wave, and really really taking the the the, um, the opportunity to ride the wave that it is now, and make it as relative as possible as a as a um, as a strategy of building the ultimate um, potential for this. You know what I'm saying? The kinetic potential. I mean, making it kinetic by by tapping into these waves and really doing some research on the on the on the beginning of it, right? about tapping into these waves that we're talking about that exist right now. Would that be, would that be I, smart? I, I don't, yeah, I, it's interesting because I don't understand what you uh, uh, put in the wind in those sails. You put in uh, uh, funding or you put in no, the people resources. Civil rights movement. Yeah. Oh, so you come in, you, the wind that John's referring to yeah. is all of these movements. So. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. right, right, right. It's just following the... Yeah. But I'm, I'm talking about, it. yeah, the, the lift was coming out of this, movement. yeah, movement. and this whole history that really you, you can Even mark in the early 80s. You can mark it in 1890 it's, it's, with it's, the rise of populism. True. It's always true. Yeah. Popul pop, you, you familiar with the populism and its relationship to the, to the earlier, the, the, uh, the theater movement that we, we learned about at Cornell. Little theater movement. Little theater movement. Theater movement. Uh, there's a, every time the people start moving, the culture rises up to meet them because it's coming out of them. You know, populist movement is problematic, but, uh, but it was still what was available at that time. You know, the mass movement that was happening. You know, because then we got Huey Long, who came in as a populist and went out as a thief. Mm. <laughs> Same Huey Long, Huey Long, uh, yeah. Huey, Huey, yeah. Huey, 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 But yeah, I mean, to your question, I, Maurice, that came. Mm. I think it, yeah, I mean, I would definitely be talking to those folks and, you know, trying to figure out how, how to connect, how to connect and, and, you know, I mean, that was, as you know, as well as anybody, that was um, Miles Horton's analogy was you got to, you, you know, you got to, you got to keep paddling till the wave builds. And mm -hmm. if you're paddling along, you got a chance of catching it and, and contributing, and, you know, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's right. What was your strategy for when you, you sound like, it sounds like you keep talking about consistently hitting these walls in the work and finding places where there was a blockage. And so then you go on and you make something else. Mm -hmm. what, what other than creating a whole other entity are some strategies that you learned about how to, as you say, stay true and stay and, and remain a dissident and progress the work forward? I mean, do you always stop at the group that doesn't agree and move on to something else with the people that share your worldview? Or do you sit and strategize at the table with people who don't share your worldview? much to be gained in that, but, uh, uh -huh. you know, not that you don't want to recruit new people, mm -hmm. you know, um, we don't share a whole world view here, you know, um, but we've been working together for years, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking of, of you guys now. Um, we don't share a world view on every point. You know, but we work together with uh, for years. Sometimes we come closer on a point that we've been arguing on for years. Sometimes we say, well, we'll leave that on the table and we'll come back to it in the future and you work on something else. And then you wait for another good idea to happen. Maybe, maybe your partner has a good idea. Maybe somebody else has a good idea. On the American Festival, one of the biggest of them was uh, right here when we did environmental justice, mm -hmm. that environmental justice festival. Wow. We tried to build strong relationships with a bunch of community organizations that were working on environmental racism <clears throat> and used the, the, the building of this festival as a way to get but uh, we didn't have the money to make it happen in order to, for it to work it would have uh, required bringing uh, for at least two, three weeks at a time, seven companies into town to work with seven to 14 different community organizations. Um, 
two and three at a time, at a piece, you know. That's how uh, Urban Bush women got hooked up with the uh, it was the Institute, mm -hmm. People's Institute. That's how uh, and the uh, 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 carpet bag got hooked into uh, um, uh, a couple of community organizations here that were using uh, um, youth. What's that youth program? Youth poverty program that they have. Carpet bag. Yeah, no, not carpet bag, but it's a national program that uh, that had it was using young people as organizers, training them to organize, and that's where their piece uh, "Nothing Nice" came from. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and some of them work better than others, and so forth. But um, we built them up that way, built up those connections that way by building relationships with organizations that saves the artist from the narrowness of his or her particular vision. Because mm -hmm. they are getting stories from the communities that they're working with. And we tried our best to find a white organization to get the robot, Roadside and, and Zuni to work with, but we didn't have good relations with white organizations at the time, so <laughs> they came in and just hung with whoever was available and helped make stuff happen over there. It took us seven years to make that thing happen. So we did that for seven years. Oh, so years. you helped work on the Zuni project too? I was around mm -hmm. while they were here. Okay. Um, I didn't, my job was not to go help them do their work. It was just uh -huh. to try to create the possibility for yeah. it to occur. Yeah. Um, but Junebug became, uh, you know, an inspiration to the right. theater company, and Adela went out there and performed in Zuni and was a big, you know, big hit out there. <laughs> and, then, and then it got them thinking about their mythological stories about the first black man Zuni had ever seen, Esteban. <laughs> you know, so I mean, yeah, it all, yeah. it was all in the mix. Yeah. But we just, you just, I mean, what we were always doing, sort of back a little bit to your question, was we were never letting ourselves get pigeonholed. As soon as they tried to say we were one thing, we would jump out of the box. I mean, that was constant. I mean, I can mm -hmm. remember after Roadside first was off Broadway, there was this whole thing to um, make us famous. I mean, people were talking about going to Hollywood. I mean, people wanted to be the agent to get uh, us to Hollywood, this, that, and the other, you know, this whole thing was going on, you know, we're not going to be that. As soon as they wanted to say we were uh, storytelling theater, we'd jump out of that box. Whatever box they were putting us in, we jumped out of it. I mean, that was the, the mode. So at the same time, anytime they just tried to say, well, you all just do this, we'd say, no, we do, we'd show them we do something else. Likewise, when we were trying to figure out ways to work on the same goals, the same principles we concerned, if we were batting our head up against the wall, we'd try something else. And, um, you know, like John said, something else would appear. And, you know, just, I mean, it's just like this has appeared. This is the same piece of work. That's why we're sitting here. Right. Because this has appeared. Thousand kites appeared. You know, same piece of work. I mean, this is, you know, so whatever strategy we were on before we were sitting here about this or before Thousand Kites, we were, you know, attuned looking for where the next opportunity would be to try to get to the same place we've been trying to get to for 30 some years to struggle for. <laughs> when, uh, and, and we constantly try to stay on the lookout for our brothers and our sisters, you know. Uh, when uh, um, uh, uh, and a veteran of the Free Southern Theater came down to Jazz Fest one time, and I happened to be performing that weekend, she came over with her husband to see what we were doing. I said, call us up. We're up at Cornell. We want to do something. First thing I know, I had a gig at Cornell under their auspices. I'm up there doing a, a, a nice little three-day gig. <laughs> and uh, the chairman of the theater department says, the, the, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but Bruce. Bruce, 
But uh, the, the guy was in the music program doing world music. Mm. He was a ballophone orchestra oh, yeah. man. And he never, uh-huh. we never got him into the no, festival. Really, right. But, but, uh, but he, w- he had hooked Bruce up and said, you ought to have this dude come up here. And I told Bruce, Bruce came to me after the show one night and said, I want you to come up. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, Bruce, you know, what are you thinking about? I, be, I, th- I th- thought he was talking about another gig. <laughs> when we got through talking, it was a three-year contract. <laughs> <laughs> and including in the second year, an American Theater Festival. And in the third year, um, a new community development program. <laughs> he just didn't say no to anything. <laughs> he said, I thought I was getting a way to open up my new theater. <laughs> and it ended up costing me $300,000. <laughs> but everybody got a piece of work out of that, you know? And we all got to hang together and work together and strengthen our unity, you know? and. So turned it, into a five-year project, five yeah, or six. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, and we got a bunch of students. Uh, the the young when we went to Dartmouth, uh, the same right after that, um, the, uh, the Shimmy, y'all all know Shimmy. Yeah, mm-hmm. Shimmy was at Dartmouth, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and uh, came out of that program because of the experience she had at the American Theater Festival at Dartmouth. And, and we got a lot of people like that. Mm-hmm. Jimmy just happened to be one that's still around and still doing. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Huh. Yeah. So now when we were just doing that show in the Bronx in November, woman comes, <clears throat> PhD student, drove down from uh, Cornell to see the show because her doctoral thesis is on intercultural work. And she uh, could find, she had no knowledge of what we did at Cornell had no knowledge that the whole little theater and grassroots theater movement had begun at Cornell and spread from there around the country. Mm. And this was the uh, history informing her uh, thesis. And And it was was totally missing out of history Mm. from her. She didn't know anything about it. And it wasn't her. It's totally disappeared from the institution. When Mm. we discovered the history, It took us months to find in the Cornell archive the all the the papers that started this major national theater movement Mm -hmm. that won Pulitzer Prizes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't like it didn't surface to the the mainstream consciousness. It did, huh? When was that? Started in the twenties, about nineteen eighteen. They weren't part. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you're engaged, you naturally run into the other people right, who are right. on the same trail. Right. right, and that's the win that Dudley was talking about. Mm-hmm. You get engaged, and you find the people. You know, and 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 you have to be sensitive as well as generous. You're not losing anything by giving somebody else mm-hmm. a piece of the action. You know, you're s- making us all stronger. Mm-hmm. You know, we and uh, including the, the the critical element that is missing is the element that represents the audience. Mm-hmm. You know, and that is where the community organizations come from. That's where the, that's, that's where the, that's that's so key. If we don't do a good job of building relationships with, with the people, not by taking over the political work as our own and breaking up, dividing their constituency. No, take our work and share it with them to help them do what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And it all grows that way, you know, it all grows. So be well in your growth. (laughs) I have a question that maybe is obvious for Carlton, Bruce, Maurice, and then about what you what you personally 
more out of this world. You mean now for the guys? Individually. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I think I already stated mine. So. So what do you want to get? That's what I want. No, no, what do you want to get for yourself? What do you want to have happen from the race? That is it. The evolution of the human spirit is what I'm here for. That's going to help me out. Because it'll get me to, to zoom a little bit further. I, I, I really do think that all of our consciousness and all of our plural spirits are tied together. And until all of us can to reach some level, I can't go no further with mine. Well, what could so be that's the, my, you know. What, what could be the personal transformation for you in this process? As that's happening for other people, let's assume that is going to happen for other people, that that goal is going to be achieved. What, in, in order to get to that goal, what, what transformation could you personally, individually experience? I can leave that fight alone so I can work on something else. More close to my personal evolution. And that's, that's I, I seriously like, how I think of it. I don't understand how you guys expect individuals and communities to have an evolution and a transformation if, if you're not stating what your own what the potential of your your own personal one is in the process of this work. You want to do this work so that you can get back to your own personal transformation, but you're asking individuals who receive the work and the community receiving the work to have an individual transformation. I, I That seems a little backward to me. How so? Because I, I think you have to have one of your own. You have to be- I've, I've had mine on, that, on this level. I really feel that I've had mine on this particular level. You feel what I'm saying? So to, to, to be able to bring some people to that point of clarity that I feel I've achieved, I might be wrong. I might be totally wrong. I might be arrogant in saying that. But to bring people to the, that point of clarity of the way that I think you know, that the movement should be, as far as an evolutionary movement of spirit, then I can go on to another level of it. And that's how I feel about it for myself, for my personal transformation. I mean, that might, that might still that might not make any sense. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if it satisfies me, but that's not <laughs> yours. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's um, it's realizing that that we're in a space where, um, like uprooted really spoke spoke volumes about our ability to uh, to have conversations about race. Um, ability or inability. Yeah, our inability to have conversations, and and even when we have conversations, um, how how you know we we bring so many assumptions to the table that we take as our own personal truth um, that have not been vetted against other other people's truth, you know, um, as it pertains to race and the relationship that we have with each other, um, and I think that that is a struggle that that we share with, with many communities around the country. Um, this is just a microcosm of, of a much larger systemic problem. So it's like, you know, we, we didn't, but we were not able to get back into those conversations to a level that brought us to any clarity about what it was that we were doing and how what we were doing in that room was, you know, tied to our understanding of racial dynamics. And so for me, it's about how do we, how do we continue to do work um, that, for me, it's very socially charged. I write, a lot of stuff I write is, is about, you know, my understanding as being a black man in the United States, in the, in the South, in Mississippi, that inherently is gonna be charged with, with a lot of uh, racial um, overtones and undertones. Um, and how do I process that to where I'm not just coming off as the mad black dude in the room, but that it's, it's educated, it's informed, and it also understands the perspective that my brethren and my sisterin are bringing to the room and you know, bringing it to the conversation. So for me, it's about creating a tool that I can use in my everyday understanding of racial dynamics in my life and in my, in my, my organizing, my art making, but also hopefully, and, and hopefully in the process to create a tool that others can use as well. Because I know I, ain't, I don't know it all. And I know I got a lot of shit to learn about race yeah. and about how it affects. I got you. Oh, Jim, I'm sorry. Damn. I don't know it all, bro. Um, I was in the story the other day about 
getting confused and disoriented. <laughs> and I was so disappointed. <laughs> I thought, I thought you had it together, now you're telling me again. <laughs> I guess mine is that um, uh, first and foremost that I share a pretty abiding love with these gentlemen, that I really feel personally close to them, and that the occasion to, um, to be able to share and uh, work about a topic that I feel like I have a lot of work to do on is a big one. Like that, that I can really feel like I can get called on my shit by these gentlemen, and vice versa, and that it never comes from <coughs> personal business. Like it's not, um, it's not aggressive. It's not about person. It's not about attack. It's like growth. So that's one of them, um, and I haven't found so many people that I feel like I can do that with in a trustworthy way. Um, and that, yeah, I really do feel like I have a lot of shit to unpack racial, like with regards to racism and my growing up in southern Louisiana and especially in a small town in southern Louisiana you know, and what I would consider a progressive household but still looking at it just being like what was all that, you know, and so just just really, it's just always, it's, it's at the forefront of the thoughts of trying to process through and figure out what that means and realizing that John O'Neill pointed out to me as he's pointed out a couple times, um, Wait a minute, uh, uh, that uh, <laughs> that I that I, I sometimes find myself in the position of being uh, an organizer of something or uh, working with people towards uh, finding money for something or uh, going out and doing things, and that with that type of work comes a position of of a certain power dynamic, and that you really have to check yourself, you know, and I have to check myself about. The fact that I'm always find myself in that position and really consider what that means in terms of me being a white man. Um, and then I, I, for this piece, one big personal stake is that I really uh, don't understand or get the whole effort to separate this idea that there's work that can direct, directly address social issues and there's work that is aesthetically challenging and artistic and I just can't, I just really see that we can do work at a very, very high level that directly addresses a social issue and doesn't skate around it, that calls, says it's about a project about race and class and that it can be just as intriguing and interesting, you know? And that, like, I feel a real, a, a, a real burning passion to be able to synthesize those ideas together a little more. no demands upon myself or seek, you know, I'm not seeking any sort of like, well, this is the person, this is the transformation I am seeking. You know, I'm putting myself, you know, out there with everybody else and, you know, something's going to happen. You know, <laughs> but I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not in disagreement with anything that, that, that I've already heard. Um, but, yeah. Well, I feel like I need to address the question too because I feel like I'm yeah, you are part of this group. <laughs> and uh, for me, the goal is to, what I expect to get out of it, is a deeper uh, understanding and view about how to uh, meet the technological changes that are unfolding because all these guys have highly developed skills in those areas. And I expect to know more about it when I get through, you know, and from as a result of this relationship. <coughs> and, um, and it's crucial for me because uh, theater is so expensive from the audience perspective and I am deeply concerned about trying to find ways to make the experience of participating in theater from the point of view of an audience less expensive and having video products 
having access to the internet, having all those things seem to me to be related to this question of how do we make our work more effective for a longer time for less per unit cost. And that seems crucial to me. And I'm, I'm really hoping to develop my uh, understanding of how that works and what we could do to, to accomplish those kinds of goals. I think for me a big um, a big uh, thing that I'm personally interested in that really ties in too with just what I'm working on a lot with roadside and in the field. I'm really interested to see if um, we can um, sort of pass the baton or relink the knowledge around this other narrative and um, whether we can make this cumulative. So I'm pretty mu I can pretty much know the history beginning with populism in the 1890s. And um, you know, I can see the line of this work that we're doing and that you're picking up from about 1890 to now. So I'm really interested in this idea of, of, of and what we had to do in Roadside, if you look at our plays, we had a, our history was co-opted by the dominant power. And what we did in the first series of our plays was re-establish through our plays a people's history of central Appalachia. So we actually were putting a new histo the, the people's history narrative back in place and on the stage. So the play <coughs> John saw, he uh, <coughs> uh, was Red Fox, and what that was about the watershed moment when industrialists came into the mountains, as John said, and uh, dominated the culture for the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. And there were two narratives about those events. One was the written history, written by the industrialists, which made the hillbillies uh, stuck in a backwater, unable to uh, do anything but interbreed and until this enlightenment of industrialization came in. Yeah, and it was just dumb till we got there and freedom from that. <laughs> and then there was a people's history that was all about resistance. And the hero of the play, and it's based all on oral histories, it's, uh, it's very factual. It's like an investigative journalism piece. Mm -hmm. So we actually reestablished this history both on fact and in a um, aesthetically compelling narrative. Um, and it, it was about the resistance and the trepidation about the industrialists coming in and big money, as it says in the play, is driving out a natural way of life. So the economy becoming the dominance of the mountains there on out for the few. <laughs> and we did it in, in just great historical detail. So, for example, we went in and looked at all the census records from the previous five years to when the industrialists came in, tracked them five years out, so for a decade. And what we found, for example, was that people were not stuck in a backwater. They were living there intentionally to avoid the capitalist system and that when capitalism came in, there was a huge out-migration out of the region to get away from the capitalism. They went to the Ozarks and then eventually to Indian Territory, Oklahoma, and that's a more complicated story. But the point was why that story was uh, important is because we were cre recreating our own history, a people's history. So the next play, picked up where that one was just chronologically as we made this new history. And then, like I said, once we had our history, 
we had the point was now we got our history we got to join our history with uh, uh, the history of black people in the south that's a joined history you know we get now that we've sort of got our thing together let's join and, and make the bigger history and that's how we got working with groups across the country because we were trying the Native American group, we were trying to make a new American history, a, a new U.S. history narrative. That's what we were doing. And it was very, very conscious. The Chicano people were doing the same thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We were all working on reclaiming this history, retelling this history, and then working on making a meta-narrative of it. I mean, and we looked to do it in the South with Roots, nationally with American Festival, internationally with uh, Voices. And it just, I mean, we had three fronts clearly in our mind. The local, where it was all based, the South, the national, and the international. And it was all... Four fronts. Yeah, four fronts, <laughs> counting the local. So like we were just, you know, so like the enlightenment that would come to us from Africa, for example, about our own little business in this country, you know, was just like, I can remember just, now I see. I mean, I did, had never studied African history, but to hear it from African people was the most powerful way, you know, more powerful than any book I could uh, pick up, or as powerful as any book. And that's what was going on, you know? He was sitting with people like Nguki and just hearing it straight out of his mouth. So, you know, I'm just interested in, you know, where this, whether this stuff can be cumulative, you know, how it can be passed on, how you guys may, and that would be, of course, the most satisfying thing for anybody um, to, I mean, the, to have happen is for others to pick up the struggle, the things you care about. Nothing could be, you know, that's why uh, people care more than anything about their children. As they see them as, and however you think of children. <laughs> when I asked that question, it just um, an image came into my mind, and I'm just saying it because it was powerful in my mind. <clears throat> it seems like you guys coming out of the Katrina project, even the longer history of coming out of uh, Jumbo Jack. Um, I don't think anyone has this false pretense that you're going to solve or heal racism, but you're going to experience some work on it on an individual level and on a community level with everyone that's involved and then the audiences and, and the communities that you're in. And it, it seems like from what I even knew about the Katrina Project when it was happening, we struggle as artists sitting in a room with kind of different approaches about how we're gonna get the work done. Like e even sometimes we're skewed about what we think the task is at hand, which I think is why John, your questions about it. Here's three questions, start right there. But how we want to experience the work for ourselves. And I think for me, I think we, we have to make ourselves vulnerable to it, which is why I asked that question of you and when I asked it, the, the image that came into my mind was, you know, if the task, if the work was to swim across a certain body of water, there are some people that would gear up, put on a wetsuit, grab their scuba tank, like they would be like, what's the fastest, most efficient way I'm going to get across this water? All the way to the other extreme, that some people would take off every piece of clothing that they have to experience the sensation of that water. I mean, I'm assuming you all have been naked in a body of water, even if it's just a bathtub at some point. And that's, it's well, a very different <laughs> sensation than it being in water with any kind of layer outside of your skin. You make the work vulnerable to you or, or yourself vulnerable to it. Um. I think that I'm, I think that it's all about expansion. I think that's why, I think that's why I'm here. I think for me it's about me expanding and I guess it's about the work expanding, it's about all of it expanding. Um, so I don't, I don't know in what, 
direction necessarily or what I'm going to find once it, we, as we continue to expand, as I continue to expand because I'm not there yet. But I think that's, that's why I'm in the room and that's why I'm drawn to this project. It seems like the right, the right step. Well, what Joanna just said really. That's why she wanted to go second so she could stick. No, I was going to say something. <laughs> I was going to say for myself, but I just wanted to say also that what Joanna said, I just thought was really beautifully put and really resonates. Um, and that I would have similar hopes, and I guess I'm interested in exploring, like, on a personal. This was a question on a personal level, like for me, what possibilities for for understanding and for personal transformation do like embodying these questions and addressing them aesthetically open up as a, like in addition to to conversation. Um, and I don't know if this is an appropriate time to bring this up also, but it's been really interesting listening to you all talk and um, continually coming back to wanting to do like this um, analysis and exploration of race and class. And it's been mentioned, like you, and you, you do keep on talking about also how you're all men. And I think that there's just such amazing possibility to, to incorporate gender into this piece as well. And I don't mean like gender in terms of like bringing, not in terms of like bringing women in, but there is such, there's such extraordinary stuff to mine around masculinity and how that is tied to race and class. And I'm sure there's these things that, mm -hmm. that this isn't new to you guys, but I just, I just, it just keeps sort of bubbling up for me like throughout this conversation. 